DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I'm delighted to be joined by Shane Hetty, who is an Associate Professor of English at Longwood University in Farmville, Virginia. A scholar of religion and literature, he is a convert to Catholicism. His essays have appeared in Catholic and ecumenical magazines such as New Oxford Review, America, and Touchstone. With Shane Hetty, we go inside the pages of Numbering My Days, How the Liturgical Calendar Rearranged My Life, published by Ignatius Press. Shane, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Chris. What a delight to be able to have a conversation about the liturgical year but in particular, how it affects the human heart. And it it really kind of aids us in conversion. Thank you so much for bringing your story forward. Well, thanks. Yeah, what uh, encouraged me in the end to to write a book about this experience was I I realized the the end of the year that I described that a lot of other people were uh, going through many similar things to me and had kind of similar uh, issues in their life uh, that I did. And so I I thought that the experience might uh, speak to other people. Well, let's let's talk about the numbering my days, how the liturgical calendar rearranged my life. Now, for those who are trying to grow in the spiritual life, th- their first look probably wouldn't be towards the liturgical calendar, would it? Uh, that isn't usually where we uh, where we look. It's it's uh, and that's actually uh, one thing that that occurred to me. Uh, uh, and uh, led me to, to write the book is that you know, realizing that a lot of times if uh, I'm seeking to grow in my spiritual life, I'm imagining that the solution is in some sort of like a far off d- devotion or some sort of like uh, exotic practice, whether it's like something that somebody came up with at Taize or whether it's something from South America or maybe something from the Middle Ages. At least personally, I'm always inclined to imagine that the, the, the spiritual solutions I need are, uh, are uh, in some sort of forgotten exotic place. Uh, when very often the church has kind of uh, put them, you know, right in front of us, um, that the liturgical calendar uh, for Catholics uh, is so central. I mean, we experience it every Sunday at Mass, whether we think about it or not. It's so kind of central and right in front of us uh, that we, we might miss it. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, and I think that's what was so wonderful about the awareness that you, you, you really grew into is the fact that it has always been there in front of us. We're, we're engaged in it right here, right now. It, it's just stopping and growing in appreciation, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I, I was uh, it, d- describing in the book was, was realizing at, at the beginning of the year um, yeah, that I felt like my life was really uncentered, that I, I was working like 60 hours a week. I was driving an hour to and from uh, work e- each way. I had a one-year-old daughter, so I was barely sleeping. I'm guzzling coffee to try to you know, stay awake. And I'm uh, in the opening scene in the book, I'm with my daughter at, at a coffee shop, and I'm feeding her bits of croissant across the table to try to keep her entertained so I can work. And I'm trying to encourage her to sing Old MacDonald to kind of keep her busy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it occurs to me that, okay, yeah, there's something wrong with my life here. I, have, um, I believe in, in the Catholic faith, um, but obviously my life isn't focused on, on my faith uh, in the way it should be. Obviously, I'm not focused on my family in the way it should be. I should be. If, uh, if my daughter is right here in front of me and all, all I can think about uh, is work, uh, and if all time stretches, uh, all, God's, you know, all the time God has given me stretches before me, but all I can think about is my next, next task uh, for work. Um, so I, I think uh, yeah, it occurred to me, at, at that moment that my life uh, wasn't centered the way it should be. And I began to wonder if, if the liturgical you know, calendar could provide a, a solution for that. I think you've just uh, articulated a, kind of a struggle that goes in the hearts of many of us, and in particular for men. And for you to have that awareness as someone who, yes, you, you, you are on the university campus, yes, you are working and doing a number of things, but you also have your toe, as it were, in, in a very real way, steeped in uh, theological thoughts and looking at things maybe through a religious perspective, that for many guys out there in particular, they who are not in that even even touching on that world, it's a more difficult thing to articulate, isn't it? I think so. And yeah, that, that is uh, definitely one thing that, that I realized, became more conscious of even as, as the year went, 
went on um, that our uh, our faith can be you know, that we we can believe you know certainly as the this year begins uh, I'm I, I'm a Catholic I do go to mass every week um, but so much of how we experience um, our daily life isn't structured by our, our faith uh, I talk a number of times in the book about how I realize that you know the church presents the liturgical calendar to me as a picture of God's time. But I come increasingly to realize that I function according to the Microsoft Outlook calendar, <laughs> uh, which every 15 minutes pops up a task for me. Uh, and a lot of people kind of function according to that uh, during the work week, and they function according to the, the, the TV guide on weekends. Um, mm-hmm. That our, our days are kind of divided between work and leisure, where I think for, you know, for all of us to some extent, but you know, perhaps especially for, for men, um, where we think of ourselves like, uh, solely kind of in terms of, of work and leisure. Um, and that's how we structure our days. Uh, and so we might, even if we um, theoretically believe, even if we would assent to the faith, um, that's, we haven't internalized it the way we've internalized these sort of forces that drive our secular existence. Now, please, you know, don't hesitate to correct me if you think I'm being too simplistic, but what you've discovered is actually the type of program that many people are craving for and are looking everywhere for. And what I mean by program is that, Shane, we're, we're always looking for that, that one book or that one thing that will help ignite our faith. And what you discovered is that it's always been there. It's right there if we just enter into it. And that is the rhythm of the liturgical year within the heart of the church. Oh, uh, that's yeah, certainly what I'm saying. Um, that uh, that that it has it has always been there, and, and that the, through the liturgical year, you know, the church gives meaning to time. Uh, I think a lot of times, you know, what uh, a lot of us are feeling, even if we haven't fully articulated it, is that uh, our, our daily lives um, you know, can, can seem empty, or our daily lives can seem devoid of meaning. Life can sort of seem like a, a succession uh, of, of moments towards you know, no final end. Um, you know, many writers have written about how sort of a hallmark of the modern condition is is, is boredom or, or ennui or um, being distracted, um, being uh, being unfocused. Uh, and you know, through the liturgical year, the church has assigned this kind of, of meaning to, to time. Uh, each day has a significance. Each day has a kind of divine lesson. Uh, and yeah, I really do think that it would make a big difference uh, for all of us if we tried to, to enter into that more fully. It can be as simple for most of us if we just, from what I what I was reading from your work and gleaning from it, it, in the pondering of even what the church offers us in the readings from the mass. Yeah, I, I, I certainly would emphasize this practice for somebody who feels like uh, they're too busy and they're too scattered and that their life is too chaotic to to enter into. Um, to take on a new spiritual practice, or they, they, they might be, uh, they might feel the need for this, but feel like they, they don't have time, or they couldn't handle it, or the commitment would be too large. Um, because yeah, uh, this this is a book. My book is in part about the um, really kind of disproportionate spiritual benefits of being faithful to kind of a simple Catholic practice. Uh, the, you can uh, get the United States Council of Catholic Bishops to email you the mass readings. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just have to sign up on their web page. And if you're somebody who's, I feel like your life is chaotic and you're really kind of driven by trying to clear out your email inbox at work, you can make this part of your daily routine very easily. Uh, and then uh, they'll email them right to you. And, and then it only takes about maybe 10 minutes uh, to, to do the readings uh, for that day. So this isn't uh, a time-consuming practice. If people want to go even deeper into celebrating the liturgical year and the liturgical calendar, I applaud them. But yeah, my book is especially about the benefits of encountering the lectionary. Uh, and then not just doing the readings, uh, but taking those readings not simply as God's truth, which they are, um, but as what you needed to hear for, for that day, the, the, the truth that God would have you hear on that particular day uh, that could guide your life. And when you think about it, you know, this is one thing that St. Francis of Assisi did. Uh, he went to Mass. He heard the story in the Gospel of um, Jesus telling uh, the rich young uh, man that uh, he that if you love God, you'll you know sell all you have and give it to the poor. And Francis took that not as just an abstract truth, but a, a truth for his life. He went out and he lived it out and it changed the world. 
Now, obviously, I'm, I didn't. I don't do anything as dramatic during this year as Saint Francis, and I'm not not on his spiritual level. Uh, but I, I tried to to listen in, in the same way. I tried to throughout the course of my day, you know, return to those readings. So when I was faced with a decision, you know, think about what those readings would would, would tell me, uh, uh, and what those readings would have me do. And and it did change. I, I looked at at myself and and the, the decisions I made. We're talking with Shane Hetty about his book Numbering My Days: How the Liturgical <laughs> calendar rearranged my life. And what's so beautiful about the book, Shane, is that you're not just telling us how to do something. Instead, you're you're really showing us how it looks when you do enter into it by sharing your own story. You're a wonderful storyteller. Well, thanks. I I really uh, appreciate that. Uh, Yeah, and and that is the basic approach of the book. I do say in the introduction, um, that uh, I am not the hero of this book. Uh, the liturgical year is, and I, I'm often its bumbling sidekick. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I, th- I, I tried to be uh, open about, um, you know, use my life as an example, not because I'm uh, so much more holy than anybody else, but you know, precisely because I'm not. Um, Pope Francis uh, has encouraged us to kind of you know, look at how grace moves in our own sort of mixed and muddled and sometimes confused lives, how, how God can uh, enter into a life like that and, and begin to change it and begin to, to, to make it uh, holier. Um, and, and I think that can give us, give us hope, because if, if um, spiritual transformation is only for people you know, who are already have their acts together and are already perfect, that doesn't give much, much hope for much, most of us. Uh, so yeah, I tried to use myself uh, as an example that way, and uh, as you mentioned, not not a, not a perfect example. Some of the stories are, are are kind of funny, or some of the stories kind of openly kind of share my confusions or, or frustrations as I sort of like grow and try to develop over this year. I also think it's important to let people know that you're a convert to Catholicism, so you're someone who took a good look at what the expression of the Catholic faith is, and then you chose to enter into it. But when you entered into it, well. You tell us, what is it that you saw in those beginning times? So my, my own personal background uh, was that I, I was raised a Pentecostal, um, but I, I became a Catholic, especially uh, as I moved to my teenage years and in, into college. Um, I, I struggled, as, as a lot of people do, uh, you know, at that age with uh, some of the complexities uh, of life. So I started to struggle with a lot of the issues that people raise against faith in God. A lot of the sort of arguments that people make against belief in Christianity altogether. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went through a period where I, I would have said I was an agnostic and I didn't feel like I really knew uh, as a teenager whether I believed or whether I didn't. Um, but I, I read a lot of uh, books by people uh, like Albert Camus, uh, who would have rejected uh, you know, religious faith and encouraged agnosticism. And I also uh, tried, to, in order to be fair, I tried to read great works by, by Christians as well. I, I legitimately hadn't made up my mind. Uh, and I, but I noticed a pattern. Uh, Every time I, I found somebody uh, write about Christianity in a way I found compelling, um, that 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 upheld the Christian truth while dealing with uh, the, the complexity of, of life, that uh, that had a faith that really sort of fit um, the wonder and variety and diversity and sometimes just bizarreness of human existence, that author turned out to be a Catholic. Hmm. Um, G.K. Chesterton uh, was a big influence. Uh, so was John Henry Newman and Blaise Pascal. Uh, and so I started to notice this pattern here, and so I, I started to think that the, the Catholic Church must be on to something if all the people who, who I kept finding you know, articulated the faith most, uh, most persuasively uh, were Catholic. So I started going to Mass and trying to you know, see what, what this thing was that they held in common. What I love about that is that in your coming into the Church and then experiencing it, you, you went to what I think for some of us who have been members of the, of the Catholic Church and we we've, we've been practicing the faith for so long that sometimes we take for granted and that is that rhythm and the teachings and the the reason why the church will uh, select not just the readings but the prayers at mass and all those things at particular times in the year that that cycle of life you saw that as a gift. Is it difficult for you sometimes to, to seek those who would be maybe be called cradle Catholics, if that's, if that's a, a really an appropriate term to use, that they don't have that sense of that? Uh, perhaps it depends on, on the person. One of the things I, I, I uh, openly wonder about at a few points in the book is um, the, the sense of the rhythm of the liturgical year. 
uh, which I, I talk about. The idea that, that time uh, has a meaning, time has a purpose, time has a rhythm, time isn't just empty or, or, or random. Um, that uh, that I, I find this very moving, but uh, as I mentioned, I didn't grow up with it. Uh, the mm-hmm. Pentecostal churches uh, I'm, I grew up in don't, don't have a liturgical calendar of any kind. Uh, in fact, uh, we so much don't have a liturgical calendar that, of course, while we had church on, on Sunday, um, if Christmas fell on a Sunday, we canceled church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because you know, Christmas shows this with your family, so that, that we are that far from having a liturgical calendar. Um, so this is something I, yeah, I've discovered and that, that I, f- I found beautiful. And the book is in part about my attempts to internalize that, realizing t- the degree to which I appreciate this from the outside, but I haven't fully made this part of, a part of me. Uh, and I guess a cradle Catholic would have to speak to, to the question about, um, is it that cradle Catholics have sort of internalized this rhythm in a way that I, I can explain because I... Uh, I haven't done it naturally like they have. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's, uh, one thing I, I, I and I seem, it seems to vary. And some cradle Catholics, I, I, seem to, I envy their sense uh, of the liturgical rhythm. What I explain in the, like coming to understand in this book uh, as an experiment, something I have to sort of like consciously conduct. Um, they seem to have really kind of intuit naturally, uh, and other cradle Catholics don't seem to think about it at all. So I, uh, I, I guess it could go both ways. You know, some some cradle Catholics I think perhaps appreciate it less than I do coming from the outside. Others, uh, it's so much f- more fully a part of them uh, that, that, I, that I envy them that, and I wish I was more like them. Well, Shane, what I noticed in your book, Numbering My Days, How the Liturgical Calendar Rearranged My Life, was that once you really entered into experience and you consciously made the effort to, to in, embrace that cycle, to, to enter into the rhythm of the celebrations, uh, to, to go to Mass, the, the, and all that, the richness that it has to offer, that fruits began occurring in your life. There was a awakening and awareness. It really spoke of what happens with conversion, which, of course, is an action word. It's a verb. It's not one of those, you know, I, you were converted. No, it's something that continues on. It's a journey that's moving towards. I think you've expressed it beautifully in, in what you are, gave us here in this work. Well, thank you. I, I really uh, appreciate that, and that that is certainly what I found. I found that as I as I did the mass readings, uh, and uh, you know, tried to think of my days in terms of the liturgical year, that it challenged my sense of values. Uh, one of the things I, I didn't realize, you know, before the year, was just how uh, automatically I, I made a lot of my decisions and actions. I, I, how much I lacked what some uh, spiritual writers would call recollection. Um, you know, where where before acting, you sort of you know, pause for a second and try to see things from God's perspective. And the liturgical year does help us see things from, from God's perspective. So, yeah, over, so over the course of the year, I, I found my, my values challenged in terms of uh, things like materialism, in terms of being um, open to another child, uh, and then also just in terms of um, you know, noticing the people around me. You know, one of the, the stories I, I mentioned in the book is, is about... Um, you know, uh, reading the Leviticus text, love thy neighbor as thyself, on, on a day uh, when we're having a particular difficulty uh, you know, with our next-door neighbor, um, and uh, you know, who's uh, you know, left th- you know, three dead cars in the garage, uh, so, sorry, three dead, dead cars in her yard, and mm-hmm. has the trim rotting off the, the porch, and we're, we're a little bit uh, kind of uptight and fastidious in things, and this is, this is getting on our nerves, and we're grousing and complaining about, about our, our next-door neighbor, and uh, and I look at the liturgical readings and realize, you know, that how much I, I've been acting without sympathy or thinking about her difficulties or her situation, um, and that we're in Lent. You know, Lent is supposed to be supposed to be about the season where we uh, we think about the poor, we think about the, the, the suffering, we think about the struggling. Uh, and I, I could think high thoughts about that at church and have a distant sympathy with the world's poor and give to an offering, but that uh, I'd been blind to the person who was literally next to me. Uh, and uh, that's just one kind of small incident of how I, I found the liturgical year sort of like changing uh, my perspective and what I was capable of noticing and how I acted. Uh, now there, you know, I, th- I think that this is where the extraordinary comes in, the or extraordinary of it all, is that it's not just the reflection as Christians, we believe that, you know, in reflections in the scriptures or in the Word of God, but now the Word of God is coming alive in your heart. It's really the action of grace that ends mm-hmm. up occurring, isn't it, Shane? Oh, unquestionably. Um, and sometimes, as in that, that instance I just told, there was a, such a serendipity between uh, you know, what was being said uh, in the text and what was going on, on in my life that I, I, I could only sort of take it as, as the graced action 
of God. And yeah, I did sort of you know, find myself you know, changing that way. Since writing this book, time has gone by. Mm-hmm. Have you continued to have that awareness? And if so, I mean, where do you find yourself as opposed to when you started the cycle even a year and a half, two years prior? Oh well, sure, you know I do find my I do find things different. Yeah, the 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 year the book describes is the liturgical year 2011 to 2012. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it is. Although the book just came out, um, it uh, it was initially the initial entries were written as sort of spiritual exercises on, on my part that I didn't initially have a clear intention to publish. Um, it was only really at the end of the year that I realized you know how common my issues were and how common my story was and that, that it might be able to resonate with other people. Um, and so then I had to, to rewrite that uh, in a way that would make sense to, to other people. Uh, obviously, if you take your personal notes to yourself, they're not going to make sense to the outside world. So it took a while to, uh, to rewrite that uh, in a way that, that would suit a uh, general audience. And then it took the publisher a while uh, in the publication process. So yeah, it's been about four years. And I have kept up with, with doing the readings. I haven't always done um, a formal written meditation uh, as I did during that year. But mm-hmm. um, uh, yeah, it does show, I think, uh, the degree of change that, that occurs when you keep with this as, as a persistent practice that um, my, uh, I, I, when my wife and I kind of recently uh, you know, reread the book as it was coming out, um, that we, we talked about actually about how we felt like God had uh, taken us places after the book was over. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we see sort of the, uh, the beginnings of our life uh, as it currently exists uh, in the book there, but um, not, not, not the end. So yeah, no, I think this, uh, this is, is certainly a continual journey. Um, that if, if people take this on as a kind of a, a constant practice you know, throughout their Catholic lives, um, yeah, we'll be we'll able continual fruit. The, the, the year I relate is uh, just a concrete example. For Shane, also, in that experience of liturgical year, the liturgical calendar, it uh, is an encounter with the Word in, in a very breathtaking way and with the readings and, and with Scripture, but it's also an encounter and an encouragement to enter into the sacramental experience as Catholics in particular, and those occasions not of, of uh, receiving it, you know, the Blessed Sacrament in, in communion and uh, also the prayers of the Church. There, it, it's a much bigger experience than even just taking in the Word, in which that itself is huge. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks. Uh, and I think that's very true. Uh, I found over the course of the year in thinking in these terms that it did change my experience of Mass. Uh, that, uh, that realizing that when, when I listen to the to these you know, you know, prayers of Mass, I, I'm, I'm uh, when I participate in Mass, I, I'm uh, entering into kind of a, uh, as much liturgical theology would tell you, I'm entering into kind of a window of, of eternity. That that Mass kind of uh, you know, shows us the divine order, shows us. Um, the world that as God would have it, you know, like as when we pray, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The mass is sort of a bridge uh, between those two things and, uh, you know, culminating in the moment when we receive Christ. And uh, yeah, certainly thinking about this over the course of the year, it did change my, my experience of the reception of the Eucharist. And, and it did exchange my my experience of, of mass where um, I would sort of take my, my, my daily, my, the concerns of my life, all, all the chaos of my day, which sometimes continue during Mass, you know, as I have a, as I'm trying to keep a, a one-year-old or a two-year-old child quiet during Mass and wrestling with her and trying to keep her in, in, engaged. So my daily life uh, does continue even during the service itself, but realizing that what's happening here is I, I'm bringing all of myself here into contact with Christ and receiving Christ into me, and, uh, and that uh, actually just mere presence at Mass is sort of a prayer to be sort of uh, you know, taken into this divine order and, and made more like um, the divine patterns that we that we celebrate in, in the Eucharist and to come to closer contact with Christ as we do it. Uh. I think your experience is a good lesson or at least a reinforcement of what sometimes in the church we, and I know having served in pastoral ministry and serving on a, a parish staff at various times in my life, that Sometimes, you know, we have programs to try to ignite people to become more involved, whether it's people who are involved in an RCA program or or maybe, you know, a particular mission will come through or a speaker to kind of ignite the fire. And we want to mm-hmm. continue to have programs, as it were, to to continue on. And then you see the programs fade off and we get become discouraged. But, you know, maybe it's it's time to assess and go back and think, 
maybe people have gotten ignited again in just participating more fully in the life of the church. And it, that that's a, that's a really good thing and a, a thing to encourage. Well, I, I certainly agree. Uh, one quotation uh, I used from Pope Francis in, in the introduction to the book um, is, is that you know, he says uh, in uh, The Joy of the Gospel that the, uh, the liturgy uh, is uh, a means of evangelization uh, you know, by which the Church itself is evangelized. So that, you know, that, the, that the, litur- the beauties of the liturgy um, can you know, help uh, pull people into the Church, as in part they did with me, uh, and uh, you know, that, that they should be one of the basic ways by which we ourselves are kind of rejuvenated and changed. Well, Shana, I wish we had more time. We're numbering our moments here uh, as opposed to numbering <laughs> my days. But I mean, is there any final thoughts or any, any sentiments you'd like to share? I would uh, yeah, just encourage people uh, to, to try this practice. If they haven't tried this practice, to, 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 to try it. Uh, that, um, yeah, to, to go to the United States Council of Catholic Bishops you know, website and sign up to have the, uh, the Mass readings delivered to you, to you daily. And to, you know, you know, then you know, try to use that uh, as, as a guide and, and try to see uh, you know, what, what happens. It, it doesn't take very long to sign up for. And um, just, uh, you know, St. Um, Teresa the Little Flower, so many of the saints, uh, the great spiritual masters, have talked to us about the, the benefits uh, of being faithful in simple things. And I think this is a, another case of it where, you know, if, if we'll just be you know, faithful to God in these small things, we'll, we'll, we'll see large changes in our results. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm very typical in the results that could happen. But I would also offer, Shane, that anyone who would pick up a copy of Numbering My Days, How the Liturgical Calendar Rearranged My Life, if they could pick up a copy of it, there's something quite lovely that happens in our hearts, I think, when we are able to witness uh, the flowering of conversion and experience in in the hearts of another. And with your gift for writing and the ability to be able to tell your story and to share it, it becomes a, a, quite an encouragement and uh, also a, a great gift of grace for all of us. So I, I would hope that people would be allowing this to become something they, they take in and, and ponder and help them to grow as well. Well, uh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Shane, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. And nice to talk to somebody who's uh, you know, thought as deeply about the, the liturgy as clearly you have. With Shane Hetty, we've gone inside the pages of Numbering My Days, How the Liturgical Calendar Rearranged My Life. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press. Or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join me next time for Inside the Pages, Insights from Today's Most Compelling Authors.